Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, if I cry, I'm, you know, it's just who I am about this. Uh, um, a good question has come up. You know, who's sponsoring this? Uh, no one's sponsoring this. This is our community. Uh, this is uh, Suzanne McCafferty, uh, to Abe Powell, myself, Louis Morrow, uh, some other people, uh, uh, people on the panel, uh, uh, Karen, uh, Melissa, people who are, uh, I'm from Montecito, she's from uh, Montecito, homegrown Montecito, who uh, have been impacted by the fires and then the mudslides. We, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of uh, uh, mixed information. Uh, unfortunately, some false information, uh, some very good accurate information. And then our goal as, as people in the community was to bring together people from the community who would share uh, the real facts, like real data, real possibilities, specifically around uh, the insurance issues, the rebuilding issues, uh, some uh, possible emotional options that you could also take for people who need that kind of help. Uh, we might touch a little bit on... Um, some of the things with the mudge and stuff, but that's a whole other event in itself, if, uh, which we might end up doing, even though Abe's kind of becoming an expert on, on mud. Um, so that's, wh that's who's sponsoring this. That's who's here. Um, myself, personally, you know, I just want to let you guys know I'm a full-time dad with two daughters, um, and just feel very, very blessed that our, our home and where we live, uh, all we have is a small mud moat, um, around the house, which is okay, great, but we're alive uh, to the impact of some of the deaths, some uh, really close friends who in many ways could have been my own daughter, could have been any one of us, we're here. And uh, uh, you know, for many, uh, for many uh, uh, we're all one person or directly impacted by uh, people who've died. And I think that's the, the, the first takeaway that I invite you all to take that if you're hearing my voice, you're lucky. We're blessed, we're here. Uh, and then the second takeaway is, if, if there's ever a community and a group of people in Santa Barbara, uh, for sure on this planet, uh, but here in Santa Barbara, that we're definitely all just one part of one whole. I mean, we've really just have stepped up, have helped strangers, people that we'd never, ever, ever will know or have met, uh, people from uh, every city here from uh, every city in Santa Barbara have really just been helping one another. Um, and sometimes, uh, unfortunately, it takes a tragedy like this uh, for a community to be tested. And our test is uh, being passed uh, by the love and appreciation and support uh, we're getting from uh, so many. Um, so on that note, uh, I do want to share one specific, uh, um, I just want to share something specific around this. So. Of the many people who have passed, uh, one of them that was a dear friend was a young girl by the name of Sawyer. And let me tell you, uh, I got fortunate enough to not only know her since kindergarten and her family, um, but I got fortunate enough, and this, stay with me, to have a, a, one of the fire captains give me a place to stay in Painted Cave. So I was up in Painted Cave for a couple of days, and it started to rain up there. And I don't know about you guys, but when I saw that rain, the first thing I was saying to myself, oh, please tell me this is only raining up here in the, these mountains, uh, which it was. But I'm very clear that pretty much for the rest of my life, when it rains, I'm gonna be thinking of loved ones like Sawyer, uh, other people that we've lost. Uh, and then, yes, there's the material part of, uh, of, it, of life. Um, but really the spirits that are now with us forever, wherever we go. So I'd like to take a, a quick, and offer you all to take a quick moment of silence. Let's do it for a minute, we're gonna close our eyes, and then we'll continue with our great panel. Moment of silence, please. Okay, so I'd like to invite up real quick for a minute, uh, Melissa. And uh, Melissa's gonna share about, come on. Uh, it's gonna share real quickly about a great resource 
uh, that she's familiar with, and and uh, just let her say her uh, her piece. Thanks. Hi everyone. So my name is Melissa Bartholomew, and I'm a PhD student at UC Santa Barbara, and I also work part time for the Counseling Psychological Services Office and um, our graduate division. And uh, I have a real personal connection to this because when I was eight years old in 1985, there was a Wheeler fire in Ohio and my parents' house burned and we lost everything. And then um, unfortunately, the Thomas fire again in Ohio burned on my parents' property. Their house survived, but a lot of their belongings burned. And so uh, I was able to handle the insurance settlement process for them. Uh, they have a little toy store and it was just too hard in the month of December to be doing all of those things. And so a resource that was extremely helpful for me is called the Disaster Recovery Handbook and Household Inventory Guide. And it's published by a nonprofit organization called United Policy Holders. And it's a fantastic organization. Um, I've really just learned so much from looking at their website and also their book. And so I wrote to them and asked if they'd be willing to send us free copies. And so we were able to get 100 free copies that are outside in the atrium. So when you're leaving, if you had um, damage to your physical property, it would be good to grab this. Or if you know of a friend who's in that situation, if you... Um, maybe have expenses only regarding evacuation costs. Those are covered really in depth on their website. So it would perhaps be better to just look at the website if that's your situation. So we'll have enough of these books to uh, give to people who are in that situation. Um, and in terms of the website, you can just Google United Policy Holders. That's what I usually do. Otherwise, it's www.uphelp, I guess you would say, uphelp.org. And um, they have all kinds of great resources. And then the other thing is I wanted to let you know, uh, I had reached out to um, Beth Cole, who uh, works at UC Santa Barbara, and she was going to be on the panel. We advertised it that way, but unfortunately, she's sick, and she has such bad laryngitis, she wasn't able to come and speak. So Beth's not able to be with us today, but uh, Dr. Karen Lehman, who's a psychologist here in Santa Barbara, was really sweet at the very last minute of agreeing to come and help table with resources and also speak to all of you for five minutes just about um, the emotional aspects of this, what's available in the community for you in terms of resources. So I'm just going to invite Karen to come on up and um, share that information with you. Thanks so much. All right, thank you for inviting me, Melissa. And thank you all for coming tonight. I also just want to give a moment to thank uh, Suzanne Grimacy of Behavioral Wellness in the county and the wonderful presence she has bought, brought to these events throughout the Thomas Fire and the mudslide. As a psychologist, I know how important this piece of information is. And I know most of you are here to get information that you can take action on, which is such an important part of the recovery process. But at the same time, I invite you all to bring attention to taking care of yourselves in many ways. Because this is, for many of you, going to be a prolonged process and a significant change in your lives. Taking action is so important, and it's an important part of healing. But bring awareness to how you're feeling in body and mind. I won't go into great detail on this, but I want you to know that there are many resources in the community that are going to be here for many months ahead. We have information tables out front about those resources. Talk to me or Suzanne directly if you have any questions. We have information on websites we can give you because keep in mind right now Everyone is in a different phase of recovery from this event. You've all had different things happen to you, perhaps, directly and indirectly. Whatever phase you're in, you might be at different levels of absorbing all the details that may be presented tonight. So Melissa has set up a table where you can sign up your email address and have the videotape of the event sent to you, as well as links for different websites and information. So keep in mind, many resources that we're trying to coordinate together. County Office of Emergency Management has the local 
Assistance Center set up until February 3rd at Calvary Chapel. The hours I can give to you later, I won't give you all the details right now. It will be closing February 3rd, but a new center will be open up called the Disaster Recovery Center. The location has not yet been determined because everyone's scrambling to get it together for everyone who needs it, but it will be there. And those details will be listed on the County of SB website. And I also just want to let you know my group um, is a group of over 120 licensed psychologists, most of us in independent practice. But we are coming together to support the community in this by offering free individual counseling to anyone directly affected by the mudslide. And we also want to start when the time comes, which is in the next few weeks and in the long term, having community resilience and recovery groups. So I have little cards and information sheets out on one of the tables for our website where you can check out that information. And we may even create an email list. In fact, I think we will. I just decided this moment. Because, you know, this whole thing is new for most of our community, and we're figuring it out as we go along. But by working together as a community, we're getting it done. You know, just like Abe's Bucket Brigade that came together. Who had ever heard of that before? But it's an amazing resource. So there's a lot of growth and resilience and recovery that also can come out of this event. Okay, so find me for questions if needed afterwards. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so now that we've taken care of the soul, the spirit, right, and that part of life, and we're here, we're fortunate, we're lucky, now we're gonna get into some nitty gritty, and that is how do we be rebuild uh, our own uh, homes, our own communities, um, our assets around us. And this panel is extraordinary, and we're really lucky and honored to have my good old longtime friend Abe uh, be the moderator. Um, the panel's gonna go anywhere they're gonna speak. Uh, there'll be some possible Q&A at the end, but any questions that you have, if it's not addressed, if you don't hear it, please write them down, give us the email, and we'll make sure that a professional gets back to you with a legitimate answer. And with no, uh, ah, I love this man. <laughs> Thank you. He, 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 he single-handedly uh, kept Montecito, a, a lot of us families from the Montecito Union, that area, so up to date on uh, information that we could actually count on from him being on the fire board. Uh, the, the information was all over the place. And thanks to social media, he started giving us updates, and then he made them public, and then it just started to expand. And really, that's all we wanted. People wanted to know, what are the facts? What are the facts? What are the facts? And here we are today, and now we're gonna get more facts. So thank you, Abe. Thanks for being here. So, you know, the, the, the last two months, um, we've been hit with kind of biblical level disasters. We've seen uh, the biggest fire in California history barrel right down on us, followed by the biggest flood in um, Santa Barbara County history. And, um, you know, the disaster has been incredible. We've lost our friends, we've lost neighbors, houses, pets, um, people have been living in all kinds of different places. My family was living in a garage with our pets, <laughs> um, trying to wait to get back home. And, you know, the, the bottom line is people are hurting. And this community is wounded, and I think we need to acknowledge that. We, we've taken a big hit, uh, and, and people are hurting. Um, and when you are in a situation like that, you know, we, we need to heal, and we're going to need to heal together. And so to do that, we need to respond to this disaster with biblical-level cooperation, compassion, and hard work to help each other get through this and to recover fully from this disaster. So uh, this is the beginning of a dialogue and a cooperative effort throughout the community. It's not sponsored by anybody, it's sponsored by us, it's for us, by us. And this is how we're gonna get, uh, get ourselves back on our feet and get our friends back on our feet. And we're gonna cooperate and we're gonna do it together and we're gonna take help from the outside because there is a lot of help coming in from the outside to support us. And we're gonna use that to help make, you know, get this community strong again and heal up from this wound we took. So to start, uh, part of the healing process, there's a lot of steps in healing. 
And uh, in, in rebuilding and recovery, there's a lot of steps. And the most important thing is to do those steps in the right sequence. And to do that, we need to think about the steps that we're going to need to take. We're going to compare notes. We're going to talk about this. And we're going to plan our response. And then once you get your game plan, the steps that you need to take, you need to do them one at a time so that you don't get overwhelmed. You pick the sequence. You work from one step to the next. Just take one step at a time to get through this. And so some of the key steps right now we're going to talk about today. Getting aid. If you need help, financial assistance to help get you through this. You know, we have FEMA here. Uh, you know, to get your insurance companies to play nice and to help you get back. We have an insurance uh, uh, expert here, a real insurance expert. And to get your home rebuilt and not to get burned by some weird out-of-town contractor or to make missteps that will make it more expensive, we have a construction expert here who specializes in rebuilding and who has a ton of experience from the T-Fire where we lost over 200 homes here only, what, eight, nine years ago. So um, one of those homes that was lost was my mother's, and so I know what it's like to go through this process of losing all your stuff, all my old stuff was in the house, like felt like I was erased, felt like my mom had been erased, the history, and to go through that rebuilding, and I know it can be done because we did it, and um, you know we're all happy and healthy now, but we gotta, we gotta start the process now, and these are the first couple steps. So um, to do that, um, I'm gonna introduce the speakers one at a time, and they're gonna talk about these steps that we're gonna take to recover, and the first one um, is from Allen Construction, and he's the CEO. Uh, his name is Brian Henson, and he's going to talk about uh, what, what it's going to take to help get these homes rebuilt. Thanks, Abe. Um, so I've been giving about a workshop a week since um, December 20th, I think, is the first one that we did. I'm going to try to pare down everything that you'll want to hear about rebuilding from a two-hour workshop into 10 minutes, um, but I'll be in the back for questions after. So after the T and Hayes Asita fires, we uh, helped about 60 people with their insurance settlements, averaging about a $150,000 increase. Um, and I think we, we had the privilege of rebuilding almost a quarter of the homes that were re rebuilt. Uh, prior to that, I work for AIG, which is some consider the evil empire, um, pre-2009, I guess. And uh, after AIG, I went to work for a disaster restoration company. And so I have this weird little niche of understanding every side of this rebuilding insurance process. And uh, what I would like to give tonight is a message of hope. Um, for those of you that have damage uh, or have lost your home, the, what you're looking at is a big unknown. And so I want to give a little bit of vocabulary um, and, a, and something of a roadmap for you to follow in the coming weeks and months ahead. Uh, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, uh, but I want to give you a sense that this is manageable, uh, that when you break it down into its parts, you're going to be able to get through this just fine. Um, it's going to be a hard hard struggle. It's going to take a lot of work, uh, and it's going to be your job for the next year uh, for most of you that, that are in that situation. But you can do it, and you can come out ahead. So um, from all the folks that we've been working with, and uh, if I had to boil it down to sort of three things, um, my top three would be first to be get informed. Uh, tonight's the first step on that path. Uh, learn how to become your own advocate, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in, in detail. And then uh, build your team, and who should be on that team. So what I mean by getting informed is you have a contract with your insurance company. Um, you can't negotiate that contract unless you know what it says. So the insurance company is required to give you a copy of that within 30 days. It's part of the California Bill of Insurance Bill of Rights, insured Bill of Rights that you have. And when you get it, um, it's something that no one has ever read unless they're in your situation. Uh, so now is the time to read it. And cover to cover, back and front, it's not going to make sense the first time or the fifth time. So read it a sixth time. 
Um, what I'm going to cover in just a minute is some of the breakdowns of how to think about it to give you some reference as you start to read through it. Um, so if you can think about your insurance policy as a series of buckets, and uh, your job moving forward is to fill up each bucket. That's how you can maximize your insurance payout. Um, so the main buckets are this. There's a coverage A, which is your house. Uh, there's a coverage B, which is everything that's a structure that's not your house or attached directly to your house. That's going to be your driveway, walkways, uh, a pool, spa, decks that aren't attached, pool house, uh, detached garage, anything that's not bolted directly to your house fence. You, some of you will have what's called extended coverage. So basically, that's usually a percentage, 25, 50, 100 percent, depending upon your policy. That's going to increase typically your coverage A limit should you need it. Um, you have contents. That's everything that was in your house. That's usually a big bucket to fill that can be tedious. Um, I'll come back to that in the Becoming Your Advocate on how to maximize that. You're going to have something called additional living expenses, which hopefully you and your insurance company have already been talking about. This is to cover your expenses while you're away. Some of your policies might say it's 12 months. You have 24 because it's a de uh, declared disaster area. The, in, the number doesn't increase. You just have a longer time to be able to spend it. You have, so that's what shows up typically on the deck page. That's what's on the front called the declarations page. Uh, you have more than that in your policy, which is why you need to read it. So buried down deep are three more sections, code upgrades or other, otherwise known as ordinance and law. That's how you, you can meet today's code with uh, what might have been in your older house. It's, it's another bucket to fill. You have debris removal um, and you have trees and shrubs. Typically, each one of those are either 5 or 10 percent of coverage A, sometimes of coverage B. Okay, so that was really boring and, and tedious, uh, but you'll see that when you go through. And what I'm going to recommend is that you, for those of you that are into spreadsheets, you build a spreadsheet and you start dropping in the dollars and the percentages and total it up because that's your maximum payout. Some people think um, that the insurance company is going to cover whatever it costs to rebuild. Most of your policies are not written that way. Uh, they're written in a way that gives you a maximum amount. And so I want you to get that maximum amount, whatever it is, uh, written down on your policy. And that's the extent of my uh, insurance language. We've got the expert here. He's going to talk a little bit more and in getting in, into that area. But it, you've got to break it down that way and understand. And so I want to give you some guidance on how you fill those, up, how you fill those buckets up. You need to talk to your adjuster. They're your ally in the beginning until they're not. Um, but in most cases, adjusters are good people, and they want to help. Most of them got into this business because they want to help people. It can be a very rewarding job. Most of their days are filled by getting yelled at. So uh, I always recommend people start by being really nice. And in most cases, you can hit policy limits uh, with some simple conversations that are intelligently guided with some backup um, on the construction expertise side to understand how uh, the language is used once you start getting into the estimating phase. Um, and you can get policy limits with very little effort, is my experience. The right effort at the right time. So start thinking of them as your ally, again, until they're not. And when they're not, there's various stages that you can get into. Uh, but it gets harder and harder to get paid out once you start going down that road. Um, you're going to need help. So I'm going to come back to this a couple times. Um, even after you've read it the sixth time, it still might, might not make sense. And you're going to say, Brian, how can I possibly fill those buckets? I don't really even know what that means. I don't know what code upgrades are. I don't know uh, how to categorize my contents. Um, and that's where the work comes in. And the next sort of thing I want to advocate is that you need to become your own advocate. So you kind of need to take charge of this situation because no one's going to do it for you. Um, and the way that you can do that, aside from being informed, is uh, getting help with, uh, with this by bringing on and people to build your team. And so 
Think of it, think of it this way. The, the whole insurance negotiation side is exactly that. It's a negotiation. It's not a black and white world here that you're entering into. It's very, very gray. Uh, you've suddenly been transported into Baja. And every price is not the real price. When the estimate first comes back from the insurance company, every single one, every one I've been through several hundred, is not accurate. It's not really intended to be accurate. It's a first stab at it. And so um, when you're working with your adjuster through this process, know that what they're trying to say is the best information that they have and that they're wrong. <laughs> and that there's more, if it, you have not hit policy limits, that that's okay, you're gonna get there. Um, and if you keep that attitude um, and you stay positive about it and you keep them on your side, uh, again, advocating for yourself, never take no for an answer, you, you will get there. So um, I wanna give an example of this in your, in your additional uh, living expenses section. The most, almost every one of your policies has a line in there when you dig deep into page 15 or 16, whatever it is, uh, that says uh, the additional living expenses are for you to keep the same standard of living that you had. Uh, and so what that means is if there's, um, if you lived in a uh, five bedroom house and you had a pool and you had an ocean view, just throwing this out there, this is a lot of people in Ventura had this situation, almost every house that burned in Ventura had an ocean view. Uh, you're not required to live 60 miles away from where your work is and have an hour long commute or more in a two bedroom place where uh, your family of six is now crammed in, in there. Uh, that's not the same standard of living. And so if you, some, of, some people I've talked to have had to sign leases or sign short-term leases. It was the only thing you can get. Availability is a different story, but if there's something available that was very similar to your house, ignore, I'm recommending you ignore the price tag. It's, you don't need to worry about that. That's the insurance company's problem. And advocate for yourself that you need to have the same standard of living. Because what you need to be is very comfortable <laughs> through this process and this is the, the thing that you need to solve first so you can get on to thinking about everything else. Uh, shelter always comes first in survival <laughs> after water. Uh, and so um, the thing to be careful of with that is the only, your only concern should be is not how much it's gonna cost, just that you're not gonna run out. And what we're ad recommending people be prepared for is an 18 month to 24 month process. And I know that's hard to hear, um, but by the time insurance, com insur insurance settlement is full, um, by the time your property is cleaned, by the time it's uh, been restored and rebuilt, depending upon how much structural damage you have, permitting happens, uh, and get through a rebuilding process that is heavily impacted. It was busy here before 600 homes in Ventura were lost, and uh, another three or 400 here were affected. It was busy before then, it's gonna be busier. And so availability of, of workers might be a challenge to slow things down. And so be prepared for that 18 to 24 months. And so when you're looking at your, that's the only thing to be concerned about with that bucket. When it comes to the contents, uh, when I mean, what I mean by advocate for yourself, as another example, is push to just give, have them give you the full amount. Start right there. They're gonna say, they're gonna give you a, a, a spiel that you should have to line item out everything. Um, and push right back to say, nope, we lost every, if you lost everything, if, you, if you're in that situation where everything is now damaged, mold is covering everything, if you had a foot or more, or six inches of more in your house of mud. Uh, everything is essentially a total loss in that sense. You can save things, you can clean things, uh, but you shouldn't have to go through the arduous effort of having to line item everything. So just right out of the gate, just give me the full amount. That's what it was there for, you lost everything. If you get to the, if you can't do that and they're really fighting you on it um, and you have to go through a line item basis, um, think of it as uh, this way, um, Carve out 40 hours over the next month, uh, 10 hours a week, and think of it as a really, really high-paying job. 
because uh, if you have three, most, most policies have somewhere between three, maybe high 200s to 600,000, kind of, I see th things in that range of contents coverage. And so that boils down to like $2,000 an hour, something like that, you know, somewhere in that range, depending upon what they've already agreed on, I would take that job any day. So in some, it's, it's arduous, it's tedious, but if you can think of it in terms, reframe uh, the conversation in your head about how, how this is, advocate and, and go and, and think of it that way, you're, you're gonna come out way ahead. Don't give up on it. Um, I'd like to leave you with, um, one last point about building your team. Um, so the, the morning before we evacuated, I stayed up all night watching the glow of the fire uh, get closer and closer. And I knew we would have to leave in the morning because it was, it was, I had uh, some friends in Santa Rosa and, and, and heard horror stories about that fire moving so fast um, and people died because they did not leave. And so we weren't gonna take that chance. Um, so the night before, I had my kids, I have three little kids, and they packed up everything. Um, and it's really amazing when you tell a, uh, a nine-year-old to pack up the three most important things, what they grab. Um, and, uh, and so we had the car uh, packed and stayed up all night just watching it to make sure we didn't have to leave sooner. Uh, and we left in the morning, and as we drove away, the kids all waved to the house. Because uh, they, they were uh, of the belief that we might not come back to it. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this because almost everybody nearby believed that it, it could have been them. And anybody who's in that situation really wants to help out. So, um, sorry, it's kind of hit me. I've been walking on ash and mud sites for uh, six weeks now. And, and uh, the way that we feel, uh, in the way that almost everybody that I talk to feels, um, architects, engineers, designers that are calling me, they're saying, hey, Brian, if you know anybody that needs help, we just want to help. Uh, and there's really great communities of uh, construction professionals pulling together to advocate for you uh, in the uh, local cities and counties that are primarily affected. So don't don't be concerned or um, bashful about reaching out and asking for help. No one's gonna charge you to have a conversation. Um, so call anybody that you know, call your friends that may have built the project or remodeled the project, uh, ask if they know somebody if you don't, and uh, put together a team of individuals that can help you navigate this process. Um, you're going to run out of vocabulary, and you're going to need their vocabulary. You're going to run out of expertise, and you're going to need their expertise to help you. Um, the insurance company at some point is going to start giving you estimates that are 40 to 60 pages long. And, and the only way to find out if they're accurate is to go line by line, page by page. Um, the, Policies, the fire policies that, mo that are kicking in to cover the debris flow were designed for fire. The debris uh, and cleanup portions of them were not designed to clean up a half an acre or an acre full of mud that's three feet. You're gonna run out. Uh, and so the other parts of the policies are gonna have to kick in. It will be a challenge. It will be a challenge to keep the rebuilding for a lot of you within the bounds of what you're gonna get. And there's resources out there, SBA has some loans, there's other ways to get potentially access to more money. Um, and if you're proceeding ahead with design, um, too far ahead of costs, you might get yourself stuck in a position that's difficult. So we're, if you're talking with an architect, I, we're recommending bring in a contractor early. If you're contract, contacting with a builder, bring in the architect and engineer early so that they can help you assess the damage and know what the permitting side is. So the, 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 the fastest you can do that and get some advocates on your side, the better. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it there and then uh, pass it off to some of the others. Thank you. So, so our family had a hell of a time with the insurance company after the T-fire burned the house down. And the advice that he just gave 
is exactly what I wished I would have known at the start of the process we went through. So it's really good advice, and I hope you really heard it. And follow up with him and ask him, those, ask him to say it again, and maybe a third time, until you really get that, because it's, it's all really important information. But now um, I, we want to hear from FEMA. So uh, Sherry Mize Rightum is here to help us understand what the federal government has made available as a resource to us to help this community recover. The m mission of FEMA is, is pretty broad reaching and I'm gonna try and tailor my remarks to this audience and this locale. Um, fortunately for me, I am not a local resident, so um, uh, I can't personalize this in any way, but I want you to know that FEMA representatives take to heart the pain and the losses that you have and um, we're very sensitive to that. <clears throat> um, I generally work with the individual housing program, but the FEMA mission is much broader than that, and I will try to touch on some of that as I speak. Um, the, the, if you go away with one thing tonight at all from me, I want you to remember that the deadline for applying for FEMA is March 16th. You can apply online. You can apply out in the lobby tonight. You can apply by phone. And there are flyers out there that have the contact information. That deadline and that application becomes your key in order to access not only funds that are directly granted you, to you to offset some of the costs, but to access the Small Business Administration loans, which is a low interest loan program for homeowners, renters, and businesses. The second thing I'd like you to know is that even if you don't want to take a loan, I suggest that you, you add that to your list of many, many items that you um, need to accomplish because you, right now you might say, I don't want a loan, I don't need a loan, but three or four months down the line you might say, boy, I wish I had that available to me. So um, um, we have experts at the LAC, at the Calvary Church, and when we get the Disaster Recovery Center that was mentioned up, we will have SBA representatives there that can process your application. Essentially, FEMA's program is not to make you whole again, but to give you just enough to survive and, and be able to function so our grants are limited to making your home sanitary, functional, and safe. And I know that's a very, very basic level, so that what that means if you have a five bedroom home and there are two people living there and they share a bedroom, FEMA's only going to assist with finding you um, or replacing the belongings in one bedroom. Um, we don't replace food. We rely very, very heavily on the local community. This county is by far the most organized, cohesively um, uh, cooperative county I have ever met in my FEMA experience. And <laughs> This, this disaster is very complex. There's a lot of pieces to it. Um, there are populations that are computer literate and uh, have administrative skills, and there are populations that don't that were affected. And we need to, as, as advocates for you, is to represent all of those people who are affected whether directly or indirectly. Um, 
the two, the, he mentioned alternative living expenses. FEMA will, will assist people with paying those uh, or, or reimbursing um, people for hotel expenses they've already incurred. But this is important. We don't duplicate benefits. So if your insurance is already paying for that, we're most likely not going to pay for alternative living expenses. And FEMA would not pay for um, the level of, of home that, as he said, is, is you're right under your insurance policy. You know, it, we're going to just assist with rental assistance if needed for um, whatever number of bedrooms you need. The county is working really hard to find available housing. The volunteer agencies um, are coming together to build a long-term recovery plan. That will include crisis counseling. I can't encourage you enough to take advantage of that. You will find over the coming weeks that things you used to do that were so easy to um, go to work, maintain your house, keep your bills paid, run around after three children, that's not easy anymore. So you need to do, as they said, just take it one step at a time. On your team, I recommend that you have somebody available to you who is an organizer. Who, who is compulsive about staying organized and following lists because that's what you're going to need in order to identify those buckets. It, that oftentimes people will come into the disaster recovery center with somebody like that to help. Um, FEMA also can replace essential personal property. So our program is not going to help with um, your 54-inch TV or multiple computers, but we will assist with tools of the trade, essential tools that, that you or the people you know um, have lost due to the disaster. So um, you, if, for example, they had um, yard tools, landscaping tools, and those were lost. Those kinds of things can be replaced by FEMA. In addition, we have um, moving and storage. As you move out of your homes, um, you may, and repairs are being made, you may need to move things into storage, and that is something we also might be able to assist with. Again, it's just essential items, though. The other area that we will pay for is medical, dental, lost vehicles, funerals, additional child care costs, um, and things like that. In order to um, qualify for any of these things, we would need for you to have your insurance statements made available to us so that we can compare benefits. If something is denied by your insurance, that's when FEMA might be able to kick in. If you don't have insurance, that's where FEMA can step in and assist. There, there are a couple other um, things I want to talk about. On that loan program, um, for personal property losses, FEMA, as I said, is focused on essentials. But through this SBA loan program, they can assist you to replace some of those items. You never get the emotional content back, but just being able to have the extra vehicle or, or um, um, some of the, the nice things that you had in your home before, uh, are, I really recommend that 
that you look into that. One of the things that we do at the Disaster Recovery Center is we make referrals to other agencies. IRS has a disaster loss program. In this situation, as the cost of your home may have, the, pardon me, the value of your home may have been diminished, um, they have a way to um, claim that it, as a loss on your taxes. I'm not an IRS expert and I'm not gonna get into it. Uh, you can look into it online or talk to your accountants. They should be pretty cl clear away f um, you know, uh, clear about the details of it. Also, agricultural losses. There, there are programs to assist with the replacement of animals and um, farm machinery and things like that through the Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm trying to think of some other federal agencies that we might refer you to, but that's the bulk of it, and I really hope that you can go ahead and, and do that. Um, I, I know I'm just hitting this very, very briefly. We have pretty good guidance online, but if I can encourage you to do anything is to get that insurance settlement into FEMA and to register for FEMA, that would be great. Oh, I'm sorry, I do want to mention disaster unemployment assistance. This is a program that's operated by the state, and people can receive, um, replace, can receive funds, unemployment assistance for lost wages. And I know a lot of businesses are down, SBA can help with, um, some of those kinds of loans, but disaster unemployment is really important to people that haven't been able to get up the 101 to get to jobs and things like that. And they have a pretty straightforward process on the um, California Unemployment Office site. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, so next up we wanna focus specifically on some of the challenges and nuances of dealing with uh, the insurance company specifically. Um, and there's some, a lot of technical information and we have uh, probably the foremost expert on this technical <laughs> side of this thing right here with us tonight. Um, and that's uh, Ray Boris, so Thank you. please go ahead. Hi. Okay, first off, I wanna make sure that everyone knows um, Suzanne McCafferty. So Suzanne, raise your hand. She is the person who you can go to. She's like a walking Rolodex and she knows everybody. And she can help you find what you need to find when you need to find it. Um, obviously, um, this is a situation that everybody would rather not have, be having this experience with. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry for all of you who have suffered loss. I was one of the luckier ones. I, I was mandatorily evacuated. My house is on El Bosque Road, uh, but I didn't have substantial damage to my home. My neighbors did, some of whom are here tonight. Um, someone told me recently that the insurance company's worst nightmare when something like this happens is to learn that Ray Boris is living in the neighborhood. And that, that was, it was nice for them to say, but in this case, um, I think the worst nightmare is that this happened in Montecito, because this is a hell of a community. And the people are smart, they're honest, they're straight shooters, and they're not gonna roll over just because some billion dollar insurance company decides that that's what they should do. So I'm gonna to try to do all I can to help you, help yourself. And the first thing I would like you to do is to write down uh, a place where you can get two articles that I wrote recently. One of them lists 15 things that you should do 
to protect yourself uh, in, in how you should go about presenting a claim. And where you go is to R. F. Boris, R like Ray, F like Francois Boris, B O U R H I S, at gmail.com. And I will send you those two articles, and I think uh, you should read them for sure, please. Uh, you don't have to be an insurance coverage expert to file an insurance claim. You don't have to know the ins and outs of every aspect of your policy. But knowledge is power. And the more you know, the stronger you are. There's no question about that. That's what I have seen time and time again over the 40 years that I've been suing insurance companies or negotiating with insurance companies to settle claims on behalf of my clients. The insurance companies treat you very differently when you know what you're talking about than they do when they can take advantage of you. If you stumble and there are things that you need extra help on, you can send me an email. I'll do my best to respond to anybody and everybody that has a question. Um, but let me just give you three fast examples uh, today of ways that insurance companies are writing these policies. I swear, they must have a contest to see who can write the most obtuse, incomprehensible language known to mankind. You may as well, no offense to the Chinese people, but you may as well write them in Chinese. Because when you read some of these provisions in the insurance policies, they go like this. What's covered on page one is modified on page seven, is excluded on page 10, and is limited on page 14. So you wind up scratching your head, and that's, again, no accident. The insurance companies, some insurance companies at least, are smart enough to know that the more confused you are, the more money they keep in their bank and out of your hands. And that's the sad reality of the way that this game works. And it is a game to, the, to some insurance companies. Um, I'll give you two examples, first of all. One of them is Howell versus State Farm. Starting, I don't know, a week or two ago, I ran across an article, an op-ed article in the Los Angeles Times written by a law professor, of all things, from San Diego, in which he was basically telling people, you should file a claim under your flood insurance policy, and I hope you have flood insurance because you're probably not going to get anywhere on your homeowner's insurance. Because homeowner's insurance has exclusions and limitations in big letters, and they do. We do not insure for flooding, land movement, earth movement, on and on and on. We do not insure for that. And the insurance companies would have you believe that they can enforce that, or they, at least they can bargain, they can use it to bargain from. No. No, that's not true. So I got on the telephone and I called, I was, managed to somehow get through, just by being persistent, to the editor of the, uh, of the letters to the editor page of the Los Angeles Times. And I said, look, I'm sure you guys didn't realize what you were doing here, but you printed a bunch of incorrect information and I'm afraid the people in Montecito are going to read the LA Times and rely on what you're telling them, and it's not correct. Oh, yes, it is. No, it's not. So I said, look, do yourself a favor and read Howell versus State Farm. Go on your little computer and look it up, and I'll call you back in five minutes. I call him back in five minutes, and the guy goes, oh, boy. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yes, you saw what I was saying. And State Farm saw what I was saying, the defendant in that case. And State Farm has wound up saying, okay, there is coverage on a homeowner's insurance policy. You do not have to have flood insurance. You're going to be covered under your homeowner's policy. Why? Because the court, you're, we're all lucky to be living in California. We have better courts in California that are more consumer-oriented and more protective of people like us than um, any other state in the United States. Bar none. This is, uh, California is in, a, is in a class by itself. There's a whole line of cases, starting with Garvey and going on, four or five other cases, and ending with this Howell versus State Farm case. And what it says is very simple. 
your exclusions in your insurance policy are void. They are meaningless. You cannot rely on them, Mr. Insurance Company. No, not if the reason for the flood is not just a lot of rain, not just because of an overflow from a, a, a river, not connected with anything else. If the reason for the flood is an underlying cause that is covered by your insurance, namely a fire, you got to pay. And that's what I wrote in a letter to the editor responsive to this op-ed piece. They printed it the next day. The, the um, uh, newspaper here in Santa Barbara, the news press, had a front page story on it. And all of a sudden, things started to change. And people were going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah, maybe there is coverage for this. Oh, I'll take a look at it. We'll take a look at it. So a couple of days ago, I wrote a letter to 15 or 20, uh, Suzanne, I don't remember how many, but a whole bunch of other insurance companies, basically very politely, respectfully, throwing down the gauntlet and saying, would you please acknowledge that there is coverage in Montecito for the flood damage and the debris flow because it was caused by the fire? I suspect that by the time all is said and done, they're all going to fall in line with that. Maybe some lawyers are not going to be so happy about it because those lawsuits, which would have been multi-million dollar lawsuits, are going to go away. The insurance companies, if they're smart, are going to say, you know what? This guy's saving us a lot of money in the long run. He's right. And that's what we should do, and that's what we're going to do. I'm hoping that they all fall in line. If they don't, what can I say? We'll see. We'll see what will happen then. But that's the one example. The second example is kind of a minor example, but it says a lot, and that is the issue of additional living expense. Um, my insurance company told me that because it was a mandatory evacuation, that I was limited to two weeks of um, additional living expense, that I, that's all I could get. So I said, can I please speak to the claims manager? Well, I don't think he's available. You tell him he should be available. Tell him Ray Boris would like to talk to him. Pretty please. The claims manager comes on the telephone. And he says, you know what? Take a look at your policy. Here's what it says. Under additional living expense. If a loss covered under Section 1, that is the, the fire and the flood, makes a part of the residence premises where you reside not fit to live in. Not fit to live in. Doesn't say that it has to be destroyed, doesn't say that it has to be on fire, not fit to live in. We cover any necessary increase in living expenses incurred by you so that your household can maintain its normal standard of living, period. You go down further on that same page, what does it say? If a civil authority prohibits you from use of the residence premises as a result of direct damage to the neighboring premises by a peril insured against, we cover the losses provided in one additional living expense above uh, or two, fair rental value above, uh, above as well, but for no more than two weeks. Now, I defy anybody to tell me what the difference is between a loss to the residence premises that makes the property uninhabitable or uh, causes it to be uh, uh, unfit and, and uh, a situation where the civil authorities say it's a mandatory evac evacuation, get out. There is no difference. The only possible explanation for that provision in the policy would be a situation where there's a false alarm, where there's a mandatory evacuation and no damage occurs. Nothing happens. So you don't have problems with your utilities. You don't have problems with your water. You don't have problems driving to your property because the roads are under four feet of debris. You don't have problems with anything else that would make the house uninhabitable. The insurance companies would love it if we would all go, okay, thanks very much, we'll take the two weeks, and we'll thank our lucky stars that you're so kind to give us this money. No, you have unlimited additional living expense subject only to the declarations of your insurance policy, which is usually in the at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if anybody has a problem with that, that's the answer to your problem. With regard to the other section that I wanted, and I, I wish I had time to go through the, these policies line by line, because I'm an insurance nerd. You know, I enjoy this stuff. It's like a game to me to beat the insurance companies at their own, at their own game. And I learned very early on 
um, that it was like shooting fish in a barrel sometimes <laughs> because the insurance companies, they don't have mean claims adjusters, as I have said before, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to settle any claims. And they don't have mean agents that sell the insurance policies, or they wouldn't be able to sell any policies. These are nice people. They're just very careful not to give them information that they don't want them to have. So they don't tell them that any exclusion in the policy um, that is vague and ambiguous has to be interpreted in favor of the policyholder, because if they don't tell the claims adjuster that he doesn't know it, or she doesn't know it, and if they don't know it, then they can't apply that to the interpretation of their policy. There are five or six other rules of construction that apply to uh, uh, the interpretation of insurance policies. All of them in California favor you. All of them do not favor the insurance companies. So I've, I've got articles I've written on that as well, and I'll be happy to send I can see that I'm going to get the hook. Am I right? Yeah. There's no hook up here. <laughs> well, no, you've got to use the hook. Otherwise, I'll just go on forever. You can tell I'll be here for, until the sun comes up. Um, and, I, and I would probably violate a promise that I made earlier that I was not, not going to tell any war stories, because I love war stories. Um, but I'm not going to tell any. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell war stories after, the, after we're all done, if any of you want to hear some. Um, the, the issue under a personal property inventory is important. And this is one of the things, one of the 15 things you will read when you look at this article. I'll tell you how to do it, OK? People screw up on this all the time, innocently, because they don't realize exactly what is required of them. Under most insurance policies, they have to give you replacement value for everything, not depreciated value. In some policies, you have to actually replace something before the obligation is imposed on the insurance company to pay that value. But if you replace it, they have to give you that value. What difference does that make? You multiply all of the things that you have in your house, all of the electronics, all of the appliances, all of the uh, television, video equipment, everything else that you have, antiques perhaps, beds, dining room tables, chairs, clothes, on and on and on. That is going to come. It will surprise most of you if you haven't done it already to see how much money it, that comes to, what it's going to cost to replace that. Insurance company would love to say, oh, well, uh, how long have you had this dining room table? Well, I have had it for 12 years. And what did you pay for it originally? Oh, I've, you know, around $3,000 or something like that. It's an antique, you know. Yeah, well, okay. Well, you've had it for 10 years. You probably have, if you had to depreciate it, what would you say, like 50%, 60%? We'll pay you, we'll pay you 50% of the value of it. Wrong. That table is probably worth three times what you paid for it if it's an antique. And the same thing is true for so many other things in your home. Your television set is not worth much on it anymore because you can't sell it because nobody wants to buy a used television set. So the insurance company loves to say, it's not worth anything, it's worth very little. Uh-uh. You are entitled to recover what it costs you to replace that. Same thing with your stereo equipment, same thing with everything else in your house. Um, that, that, that's just a, a fast uh, summary of the, of, of, of the personal property inventory aspect of this. The dwelling protection aspect is what goes on for 44 pages in your insurance policy. Please don't think that I am telling you you have to become a coverage expert. Insurance companies actually will send out for a coverage opinion their own policy that the insurance company wrote to one of their mega in, in, uh, law firms that they have all over the country in every city and, and, and town in America, they've got 500 person law firms, they send it out for a coverage opinion. What? They wrote the policy. What do they need a coverage opinion, opinion for? Because they don't know what the policy means. The courts know what the policies mean. Lawyers, a handful of lawyers know what the policies mean, but the insurance companies often do not. So I'm gonna shut up now. I'm, I, 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 I can tell I'm getting in trouble. Okay, um, so uh, next up, um, we, we're going to have a little bit of uh, information from public safety. And, uh, you know, uh, in, in this recovery process, I think it's important to be stated at, at, at some point and probably often that um, uh, we're very concerned that mudslides could happen again over the next year and two years. And this is something 
that we think everybody needs to take seriously and it's not a nice or fun thing to think about, but it's a real thing to think about. And um, um, so I'm just gonna put that out there. And uh, we are gonna hear from uh, the director of Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Management, and that's Rob Lewin. Okay, good evening. And, and also with me again is uh, Suzanne Grimacy from uh, uh, from our behavioral wellness and I encourage you to spend some time with her if you need any resources as well. We have a representative from Supervisor Doss Williams' office, uh, Darcel Elliott. And you had a, a comment that you needed to make. Do you want to do that? Just quickly, I wanted to let you all know that we're um, convening a community process to talk about the rebuilding of Montecito. There have been a lot of great ideas that have been coming to us, and a lot of people are thinking about the same sorts of things, and we want to make sure we're not duplicating eff efforts and really trying to convene people who want to work on similar projects together. So we're going, we have a little survey that we, um, we made to get ideas on the rebuilding and also ask how people want to participate in that process. Process. So I'll leave it outside in the atrium area, and you can take one. And um, there's also a link to do it online. So thank you. Thank you, Darcel, and, and thank you to all the county supervisors for their support during this emergency, um, and particularly, of course, um, Supervisor Williams, who's been there arm in arm with all of us and all of you. Um, so I only have a moment, and I'm just going to try to capital, uh, talk about a couple of things. And first, I want to address the issue that was just brought up about the future. So you have all been through a lot. How many of you have been evacuated twice? And how many of you have damage to your home? And how many of you have homes that are destroyed? And to all of you, I want you to know there's not a moment, there's not a moment in that emergency operations center that we're not thinking about you every moment. And we have been uh, since December 4th when we had our power outage and we saw the fire marching into our county. Uh, we recognize that this is about people and not numbers and not data. I have plenty of data, uh, but we're doing it because it's the right thing to do because our friends, our community is impacted and we want to make sure uh, that we're doing best by you. Um, there are 590 uh, structures uh, that have been uh, either red tagged, yellow tagged, and green tagged. And some of you are yellow tagged and you want to become a green tag. We want you to do that. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about three things then. I want to talk about the future storms for a moment and I want to talk about the mud and debris which you all want answers to and I want to talk about the disaster zone that we call it now and what's the future of the disaster zone. And then I know another question that's coming up today in big time news all the time we, we hear is dust. So super quick. Uh, next Monday we're going to be, I hope it's Monday, I hope we're prepared to do that. We're going to roll out uh, how to prepare for the next storms. Unfortunately, we're going to have to be prepared for the next storms because uh, what we experience potentially could happen again. Uh, our debris channels don't look like they did before the storm. They're filled in many cases, and our debris uh, basins are filled, which have uh, made it exponentially worse if we see another storm of the caliber we had, or even one less, uh, because it will leave those channels. Uh, their debris basins can't hold on to anything because they're full. Some are already cleared. That's super important. Um, so we're going to be preparing you. We're going to have an interactive map. We're going to give you instructions. But there's two kinds of storms that we have, unfortunately have to think about. One is the one we can track, we see it coming, we give you plenty of warning, we tell you to leave, and then there's the surprise ones where we have very little time. And you need to think about both of those, the ones that sneak up on us, much like did in El Capitan uh, a year ago. Um, and in that vein, um, we're gonna give you all the information we can. Hopefully we're having a press conference on Monday, stay tuned to that. But I don't want you to live in fear either. We want, as all of you I know can do, to live with hope, with the idea that, yes, we're going to go home and we're going to have nice lives and we're going to get used to this idea that we're going to have to leave sometimes. So you're going to just get into that. I, I make the analogy about certain communities in our, in our world that move all, every season. We have tribes and communities that... In the winter, they live in the mountains, and in the summer, they live in the valleys, and they're happy people. Now, it's something to just sort of think about, that being this, you know, in a transient world, 
uh, for a bit is going to be part of your lives and we're, we're going to get used to that and make the best of it because as I've been often said, uh, we get the choice of being survivors or victims. We all get that choice. And I want you all to take be survivors and to get through this in a positive way and, and express that with your families and your workers and all the people that are in your community. Okay, let's talk for a moment about mud. Um, what do we do with the mud? Um, so, of course, uh, this is the information that I provided. We're going to get this down in writing. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have this out on our website tomorrow. Um, so, uh, our first objective, uh, um, let, me, let me get down to my notes here. On, uh, uh, we need people right now to put the mud in an area of their property um, as we try to find relocation sites. So, if you have a property that can hold your mud, you need to hold on to it for a bit. We don't want that mud to be in a location that it's going to add to your debris flow if we have a storm. We don't want you to have equipment parked in a place that's going to add to the impacts of a debris flow. But we're working on a couple of things. This is our plan. And every day we talk about this, every, a lot, is we're trying to figure out if we can get transfer sites, some property that we can have you bring it to, and hopefully get some place to, so you can get it off your property. In some cases, there's going to be folks that are going to have to hang on to their mud as part, of re, as part of their reconstruction due to costs. There may be architects that can come up with methods of being able to have a different kind of a, a property if you have a, a loss to it and how, how that might look. Um, we have an emergency permit request that we've sent to the state to be able to increase the capacity of the Tahegas landfill so that you can put it there. Uh, we are trying to identify, and there's some sites already that you can take your mud to. You have that choice right now because you have the choice because you're a property owner and you have property rights to move your mud now. However, it's very expensive, and we know that. So that's not the best answer for many of you. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars from estimates that I've heard from some folks. Um, so we're trying to figure that out. I can tell you that the government is not going to be able to afford to take your mud away. It's going to be one of these issues, as you've heard from the folks previous, that you're going to have to figure out. Some of it will stay, some of it will have to be moved, and hopefully this mud has value to a farmer or to a con another construction site because it's clean and it's, it's good soil. It's alluvial soil. And the rocks, same thing. Maybe there's a way we can use those rocks and we can get them to a quarry or they can become valuable and that way you can get rid of them. So we talk about all these things and we're, we're writing a plan as we speak. The person on, on the, on the uh, team that we're, I'm, I'm on every team, but on the team that's doing this is writing up the plan right now and we're gonna have some uh, information tomorrow. But unfortunately, we don't have take your mud here now. We don't have that. We barely have the ability to figure out where to take the mud from public property, as you all know what's going on at Goleta and other locations. Okay, um, let's go on to the next uh, question, which is what happens in the disaster zone. How many of you are in the disaster zone? Okay, the disaster zone is scheduled to go away. So I'm gonna announce in a day or so that the, at a certain date, the disaster zone will no longer be a uh, disaster zone. It was called that because it provides security to you. If someone goes into that disaster zone that does not belong there, they can be arrested. But what we want you to do right now is secure your properties. So go f meet with your, uh, with your contractors or with uh, companies that do this kind of work, whether it's putting uh, plywood up or some fencing around it to secure it, but whatever, locking the doors in some simple cases but somehow you need to get your property secured so that when we lift this in a couple of weeks that your property is able to secure because we cannot have the number of uh, uh, law enforcement out there that we currently have. It's, it, it, we can't, first of all, afford it, but we just can't have that. We're going to have to get there. So this is your time to secure your property, and then we'll change that designation to something else, and then you'll be able to uh, um, you know, get on with it as well. So I know it's tough, and uh, we're here doing the very, very best we can every day. Thank you. So um, one thing that was mentioned um, uh, earlier uh, under the FEMA uh, discussion um, was this disaster unemployment assistance program. Uh, the deadline for filing is uh, February 20th. Wanted to say that. The last thing is, I um, want to talk about the mud for a little bit longer uh, because a lot of people haven't, 
aren't even able to get into their homes. Their doors are blocked with mud, and now we're being told to secure our homes, and a lot of people don't even have access to, to the inside of it, or the inside's got mud in it, or they can't get into their driveway, or their cars are stuck in their driveway, and they can't get around. So we formed the Santa Barbara Bucket Brigade. We're volunteers, and we are going to be working in ant farm numbers this weekend with machines and volunteers to get those cars out of your driveway, to clear your driveway so that you can get to your garage and your home, try to clear a path to your home, and we're going to try to get mud out of the homes because a lot of people haven't even met with their insurance adjuster yet. And they're saying, well, you've got to talk to the insurance adjuster before you can clean your house out. Meanwhile, their house has got a foot of mud in it and it's rotting away. Right? And we all know this. So we're not waiting for any of that. We're not arguing about any of that. We're just volunteers and we're going to have hundreds of people with machines and machine operators and we're going to come move the mud. Now we can't take it away. We just heard that, right? But we can move it if you have a place on your property that we can pile it up to get it out of your driveway so you can drive in and out and then you can work on your home. And if it's in your home, we can dig it out of there. So. Um, I urge everybody who needs this kind of assistance or knows somebody who needs this kind of assistance to contact us by emailing tfirerelief at gmail.com. That's T-E-A-F-I-R-E-R-E-L-I-E-F -E -E at gmail.com. If you email that and you need help, put need help in the subject line. And, under, and then in the body of the email, write the kind of help you need. I have mud in my house. I have two cars stuck in my garage that you can get out. We've pulled out like 10, 15 cars in the last couple of days. Um, there's people here I've seen whose cars we've pulled out. And so we'll get people in there. We'll get your cars out. Um, and we're going to have so many volunteers that we actually need places to work. You could help us. <laughs> I got so many people coming in to help that I need you to help me find people who need that help so we can get the help to those people in an effective and efficient manner this weekend. So I'm just going to invite you all to think about that. Contact us if you need anything. We're here. We care. And we're willing to get down in there in that muck and get you back in. So cheers. Can I add something up? Yeah. And uh, let me, another part of our planning process is to capitalize on the volunteerism. Uh, we're looking at having a cleanup weekend for properties that are too small to store the mud on their own. And we're going to try to uh, get right to those. There's some neighborhoods that are just regular size lots. And so uh, stay tuned for that information. I hope to have that out very soon uh, on when that'll be and how that'll look. So thank you. Do we have any questions that? Uh Sorry. The dust. The dust. Okay. So, so uh, the dust became an issue. I was just uh, had a meeting, uh, Suzanne and I, with the uh, teachers and principals and superintendents from your schools, both private and public, and there's a concern for them. Um, so uh, we're going to look at uh, trying to come up with some dust mitigations. We're going to meet with Air Pollution Control District, and we're going to meet with uh, uh, public health officers and try to sort it out. Here's here's one problem. We're in a drought, and Montecito's not in a good shape with the drought. And we don't want to use good water to wet down roads, so we're going to try to find alternative water, uh, gray water, water trucks, those kinds of alternatives. Obviously, as people are moving dirt, more dirt will keep coming on those roads. So the simple answer may be we're going to have to keep those main roads wet, but I, I have to tell you, we're going to stay tuned, but we recognize it as a problem. And, and from the beginning of this emergency all the way through to recovery, when we get a problem, we find the solution to it as best that we all can. I know you're all doing the same thing in your own lives. So we have, we have time for like one or two questions. Uh, Lewis is back there with a mic. If somebody have a question for these panelists that they'd like to get answered, yes, ma'am. On insurance, Ray, under California law that I would like to know about legislation per se, one of them is when we're required to evacuate, I was told that there's no deductible, that on your insurance policy it's two categories, catastrophic, meaning no deductible when I'm told to evacuate, and then when I file my property claim, then my deductible kicks in. That was my first question. My second question after the T fire like you, I did not have coverage at that time for replacement value. And so a lot of the codes had changed from the time I had built my house in 1989 to um, 2008. And then I was told, since I didn't have that code upgrade, 
then that all had to come out of pocket, which it did. FEMA denied my claim, so I could not get any low interest insurance. I was a single mom with two little kids, desperate, how am I gonna pay for all this? And FEMA was sorry of no use to me. I was just flat out denied as a mother with, that didn't have employment. So long story short, I was told that since the T fire, we now have some California legislation that could waive the required upgrades. For example, here locally, we now have to put in sprinklers. Um, when I built, my wrought iron was four inches apart. Now the code's three inches apart. It used to be three feet height. Now it's four feet height. Something like that was a $300,000 expense to do my wrought iron. Uh, fortunately, Salute Carbohol got a waiver on the wrought iron, but there were other things. So what's changed in California law since the T fire is my question. Uh, I, I can just try to answer that generally. I'm not sure if this is addressing your exact question, though. But uh, when you're talking about code upgrades and your insurance policy, that is a contradiction in terms. It does not mean what anybody would think it would mean, and that is I'm paying an extra premium, my policy limit is X dollars, pick a number, and code upgrade coverage means that if I have uh, uh, increased building codes that I have to subscribe to before I can put a roof on the house or before I can use this material or that material, that it's gonna cover that. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. It's the same thing as um, the kind of coverage that increases your policy limit uh, and guarantee with a full, repa re I can't say it, replacement guarantee. There is no such thing as a full replacement guarantee. If you read the fine print, there's a cap or there's a limit on it to X dollars or Y dollars. Uh, I'm not aware of any legislation that has invalidated those provisions in policies, but it's hard to tell because a court made law is equal in importance to legislation, just as, as though the court decision was signed into law by the legislature and by the governor. It's just as, as strong. And you have in California an insurance code section is called 790.03, 790.03H. Um, and what that is is a statement of insurance companies not being permitted to engage in certain uh, types of conduct in the handling of claims. They can't use unreasonable delay. They cannot pay less than the value of the claim. They cannot use fraudulent um, uh, reports submitted by insurance company experts who sometimes will say things that are not exactly correct. Uh, I, the heck with not exactly correct, they're downright fraudulent. If you take a look, if we go home and take a look at the 60 Minutes program uh, on, on Hurricane Sandy, that was about 10 years ago. The people still aren't being paid their, their claims on that. 60 Minutes went out and they took one of the structural engineers, one or two of the structural engineers, and they said to him, you know, I don't understand how it is that you can say that there's no structural damage to this house. It would show him the picture of the house that's falling down. And he, he, the structural engineer said, I didn't say that there was no structural damage to the, that house. Well, is this your signature? Yes. That's your name? Yes. That's your structural engineering n number that you're, you're registered under? Yes. The report says, I'm quote, there is no structural damage. See, that's not my report. It's your name, but it's not your report. That's right. I came to exactly the opposite conclusion. The insurance company put a different report under my name. So this structural engineer was so upset about it that he went out and reopened over 100 claims where they had found no structural damage. And over 90% of them were fraudulent reports. It was absolutely untrue. And that is the kind of thing that happens. This particular example, because it was Hurricane Sandy, because it was 60 Minutes, you know, I've been on 60 Minutes a couple of times. And we spent half of the time swapping war stories, the kind of war stories I'm not allowed to tell today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the reason for that is because they've seen it all 
They've seen in so many different capacities and so many different types of insurance, property and casualty, business insurance, we didn't even talk about business insurance. You know, if, you, if you take a look, I was talking to uh, uh, some people in, with a business policy recently, and I said, wait a second, let me ask you a question. In order for you to make a profit in your restaurant, you have to first pay your overhead, right? All right. Well, what is your overhead? And I don't remember what the, what the exact number was, but let's say it was $100,000 a month. And, and um, what, were you, what, kind, what kind of business were you doing? About $150,000 a month. So when you were doing $150,000, $50,000 was profit, the $100,000 was you had to use to pay your overhead. Otherwise, what? You would lose your business, you would lose your employees, you wouldn't be able to, to pay for your insurance premiums and so on and so forth, that's right. Well, what's going to happen? The business is going to go down. Are they going to be making $150,000? No. Are they going to be making $100,000? Probably not. And so the uh, insurance companies, you have to take a look at the fine print and how they, uh, how they define additional, uh, I'm sorry, not additional living expense. Um, what? what? Yeah, and the way they do it, in, in most cases, is they'll say, okay, well, we've looked at your last five years of, of income, and we've got those numbers, and we will provide the difference between what you earn and what you were earning before, so you can meet your overhead, you can pay your employees, you don't have to fire them or give them layoffs and lose them forever, and that's the kind of, 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 of a business policy that I think is... It, it was worth its, it's worth the premiums. But okay. there are other ways of take defining couple, that. It's, we should take a couple other questions while we still can. I'm I'm sure that, I think there might be a couple other ones. So, uh, yeah, I hear Bob Hazard has a question right here. Right here in the front and then uh, back there and maybe that lady <clears> right there. Uh, just a question for Rob Lewin. Uh, most of the damage for the 400 homes came south of 192 in the voluntary evacuation zones, not the mandatory zones. And a lot of that occurred, and the creeks spread out at the bottom down on Jameson and the, the alluvial plains. As I talk to the, most of those owners along Jameson, and their fear is that, is the county going to allow those homeowners to rebuild, or is it going to create a Rock Creek Parkway like they have in Washington, and so they won't have any permits? And say, till they get the answer to that, they can't plan their lives. And so, you know, I think the answer that I usually hear on that is, well, we're studying that. And we don't know whether we're going to have restricted areas and where they're going to be. Uh, so an amazingly difficult question. However, let me just lay this out. We live in the United States where the Constitution allows people to have property rights. And the government cannot do a taking. Am I right? Yep. So uh, know that right away that you get to drive your own property's future. Um, your property is very valuable, and the government doesn't have enough money to go and buy your property. Uh, there may be grants that we can look at for specific properties that will be beneficial to the flood control, to, you know, for our flood control processes. Maybe there's open space area that could be created in certain cases like what you were describing in that one uh, example you used. But for the most part, what we need to do is come up with many alternatives, such as how do we create homes uh, that can uh, be higher? Uh, how do we uh, work, in the, you know, work on our flood control system for mitigation uh, efforts? We need to come up with all kinds of uh, solutions to this. But the first thing we need to do is get this map out to all of you so that you can identify and see where these risks are uh, so that you can keep yourselves out of harm's way in the next few winters as the brush grows back. Um, so we're, it's a big problem, and it has to be a whole community approach to it. We don't get to only solve that in government. It's solved by all of you and us to working together on it. I, I can tell you one thing about that. Um, there's a, I'm sure that you are familiar with the term inverse condemnation. What inverse condemnation means is that where there's a government taking of property for public use, they owe the property owner reasonable compensation for the land that's being taken. That's what happens when they build a freeway. You know, they buy up the, the rights of homeowners who, who live where the freeway is going to go. Same thing if you have to have a, a catch basin in a particular area that has been determined to be necessary in order to save all the downstream uh, users. 
And if that's going to happen, then people are entitled to fair compensation through inverse condemnation. I'm not sure. It's a very interesting question as to what happens when your property is, is devalued as a result of that. Is that part of your loss that you can recover for under your homeowner's insurance policy? Well, if you read the sections in these homeowner's policies having to do with land value, you'll see that it's, it, it's one of those situations. Here, let me just read Wait, hold on. Let's, let's say take on another couple questions here. Okay. I'd like Ray to tell us whether he would uh, counsel people to employ an independent adjuster to advocate for the property owner uh, against the insurance company. Yeah, uh, I, I have pretty strong feelings about this, I have to say, and maybe I'm wrong, um, but I don't think so. Public adjusters are not trained in law, they're not coverage experts, they don't have the ability to negotiate down and dirty with an insurance company, and what they're trying to do is to, be, is to settle claims. And I've done a lot of mediations in my life, and it never surprises me that insurance companies come in and they offer $100,000 where the demand for the claim is $2.3 million. They are not embarrassed to offer a ridiculous amount of money, and that's the way they do it. They have their own mechanisms for negotiating, and they're very effective, and they're very good at it. So you have to be very careful when um, you're negotiating with an insurance company just because they're in a profit-making business. That's what, they're, that's what they do. I don't blame them. And when I invest in a stock, I want it to make a profit, right? Right, right. But so, but, so are you saying that they shouldn't get an independent? Uh, no, you should not hire an independent adjuster. Okay. All right, just wanted to make sure. Okay, uh, well, we, you know, guys, we actually, the, this room is booked by uh, another group, and we, they kind of let us overstay to get a couple of these questions in, but we actually have to give them the room now. I'm so sorry. And, but please follow up with these people uh, and get some more answers. Thank you.